there. I'm out for my uh, my morning hike. I'm out in the Tahoe National Forest this morning. I'm just walking kind of a logging road. I hope everybody's having a good day um, with my, my super dog, Lucy. There she is. She's getting her exercise in too. So anyhow, I've been wanting to uh, do a series of podcasts about various fishing products, things that uh, They've kind of changed the way that we fish or kind of changed the way that we approach tackle. And I've got a whole list of things I want to talk about in the future, but today I want to talk about line. Um, I'm going to do a future podcast just about braided line because I think it, it is really just, it's been a game changer. But uh, today I'm, I'm going to start with the basics. So let me rewind a bit. I'm 50 years old, about to turn 51. Um, I distinctly remember buying my first spinning reel. I was eight years old and Back then you had three choices of line you you could get mono But if you didn't want mono you could get mono But of course you could get mono uh, So that was pretty much it. It was all about mono and back when I was a kid You know they had various grades of mono. Well, I would buy the the El Cheapo stuff, which was about a penny a yard, you know, I'd buy a reel, have the guy spool it on there and then not change it for three years. Um, but, you know, it didn't take me long to start to figure out that one, if you don't change mono fairly often, it gets hard and it gets brittle and it's going to start breaking on you. Um, so I fished that bargain basement stuff for a while and then, you know, in my teens, wow, that's really bright, I got more, uh, I got more serious about fishing and I started using the line that the quote-unquote pros used, which was Maxima. Um, I think it was the Ultra Green, the Moss Green line. The quality of that line compared to the cheap stuff back then was just, just through the roof. And that's also when I became a big believer in the Moss Green line. And I'll talk about that in a bit. But, uh, you know, and after that, I used Maxima for a long time. I still use Maxima. It is... A, a top notch uh, monofilament line. It's limp, it's tough, it's very abrasion resistant, and uh, it's never really failed me. It's good stuff. Um, come the 1980s, I was really getting into charter boat fishing, and I was reading the, uh, the magazine that I, I'm now part owner of, the Fish Nipper magazine, but I was just reading it back then, and they started talking a lot. Dan Bacher, who's the other editor, he, he would be writing about P-Line, P-Line CXX. Man, that stuff is, is great. That's great monofilament. It's this new stuff. Of course, I had to try it. So I was doing my fair share of trout fishing back then, but also charter boat fishing. So here's, here's my P-Line story. So I had a spinning rod that I had spooled up with four pound test CXX, um, the moss green stuff. So I was going salmon mooching one day. Moochin, Moochin was popular, and I had my regular bait caster style Moochin rig, probably 17 pound test on it. And I'm on the old Salmon Queen 3 with Captain Harry out of the Emeryville Marina. And uh, we get out on the water, and the ocean is just, just beautiful, it's calm, they're salmon, but they aren't biting. It's, it's, it's horrible. Um, we're fishing and fishing and fishing, and nobody's catching anything. We might have got a few, whatever. But uh, at some point, I'm reeling up. And I see these big jack smelt chase my uh, my uh, gets it and uh, anchovy strip right up to the top. And I thought, well, I'm not catching anything. I might as well have some fun. So I grab my spinning rod, which I'd brought along. It's got a little cheapo Shimano spinning reel on it. It's loaded with that four pound P line. And uh, I grab a white crappie jig and I put a little piece of anchovy on it, and I really got no control. I mean, I'm in the ocean, so I'm just stripping off line and it's kind of randomly sinking a side of the boat. And all of a sudden, something grabs it. So I reel down, I set the hook, and immediately I know this, this isn't a smell. This is whatever it is, it's solid. It feels like I set it into a log, but I mean, it's a real light rod. So the fish takes off, the drag is just smoking off line. I tangle like half the lines on the port side of the boat. I, I wouldn't have won, won any popularity contest. So the deckhand is cutting lines off my line and I'm fighting this fish. Around the bow, back to the uh, starboard corner on the back. And you know, 
15, 20, 25 minutes go by, I can't move this fish, but it's getting slower and slower and slower, and it's starting to act funny, and somewhere in this process, the fish actually died. He went belly up, and now there's birds. We can see him, he's a couple hundred feet away. See a white stomach. Fish turns out to be an 18 pound salmon. Um, so now I'm, I'm pulling the fish across the surface. I, I, I reel down, load the rod, and I just, ever so slowly, I'm pulling this fish to the boat. And uh, as it gets closer, there is just this big wad of sinkers and lines and, and everything about six feet from the fish. And uh, at the end of the story, Captain Harry reaches out there and he nets that big old salmon. I landed him on four pound test and I could not believe how abrasion resistant that four pound pea line was. I mean, I was just utterly blown away and uh, I've been a fan ever since. It's, uh, it's extremely tough, it's just good stuff. Um, and then the other line I've been using more recently, say in the last five years, which to me is very similar to P line, and that's your Trilene uh, big game line. It's a little stiff, so is P line, but it is tough. It's not going to let you down. So I guess if I had a if I had to choose my lines, mono lines, my number one choice would be Maxima still, and tied for second would be P line and the Trilene big game line. Now. This, this is kind of an interesting aside. I'll just throw it out there. It doesn't really mean anything. I got to tour the factory where they make the trilene a few years ago. And here's how monofilament's made. Monofilament line is made. It's kind of interesting. There's all these little, they look like rabbit feed. They're little pellets. And uh, whatever the mix on the line is, it's, it's in pellet form. They measure it out. And those pellets are melted. And they all congeal together. And while the substance is still hot, it extrudes out of the machine. It's a big giant machine, it takes up a whole room. And it comes out and it's, it's thick like rope. And then it goes over a series of wheels. The more wheels it goes over, the thinner it gets. The diameter dictates the braking strength. So 25 pound test goes over less wheels than say four pound test. But that's how it's made and it's, it's pulled over these various wheels while it's still hot and it gets thinner and thinner and thinner. And at the end of the production line, there's big giant spools like the ones you see the, the electric company has their wire on, huge spools that hold miles of line. That's what the line's going on. So going uphill here, I'm kind of out of breath. But uh, yeah, I found that interesting, but that's just an aside. So, so uh, when it comes to color on mono, um, I, I have the pleasure of working with a fella, a hardcore SoCal saltwater guy. His name's Kit McNear, and he's a bit of a, of a tackle junkie. And uh, we, when we get together, which isn't that often anymore, we like to talk about just nerdy fishing gear stuff. And one of the subjects that came up is invisibil in invisible line, or the invisibility of your line. Now Kit fishes Baja, and that water's clear, but he doesn't use clear line. He told me, I use moss green line because I'm not trying to match the color of the water, I'm trying to match the color of the background. And I couldn't agree more. You put a GoPro under the water, everything looks a kind of a washed out shade of green. And that's what we're really trying to match, and that's why I use the green line. It looks like the rocks, it looks like the moss, it looks like the water. So that's just an aside, match the background, fool the fish. So here's some of the benefits and drawbacks of monofilament line. One, it's cheap. That's a pro, that's a plus. A con is you got to change it regularly or it'll get brittle and it'll let you down. Um, it has a lot of stretch. Now that could be good, that can be bad, depending on what you're doing. Let's say we're digging for lingcod, the water is 150 feet deep, it's snaggy. We got a big treble hook on our big metal jig. That stretch is gonna translate to reduced sensitivity. Reduced sensitivity, you're gonna drag that jig and you're gonna snag. A situation like that, you wanna be using braid. 
we'll talk more about braiding in another podcast, as I said. But in that in that situation, stretch is a detriment. Let's say we're sturgeon fishing in, in the delta. We're in 50 feet of water. We got on an eight ounce sinker. The big sturgeon comes chomping on our bait. His mouth is about as supple as a catcher's mitt. And we set the hook. You're gonna have to set the hook hard two or three times to account for that stretch to get that hook into the sturgeon's mouth. Once again, braid, same situation, no problem. I just read a book uh, about the baseball player, Ted Williams. And of course, he was a great fisherman, big time angler. And when he would try to hook a, a tarpon, he would sit the, set the hook six, eight, 10 times using mono. And he was accounting for that stretch. He wouldn't have had to do that if he was using 65 pound braid. So stretch can be a detriment. However, stretch can also be a positive. When you're fishing for soft mouth fish, salmon, kokanee, stuff like that, that stretch can keep you from losing fish. Um, here's a story, another story. Uh, I was out on the Kenai River. I was using an Abu Garcia Cardinal Reel. And I think I had about 300 yards of 12 pound mono. And I'm trying to, trying to catch sockeye salmon. Well, I accidentally snag one of those big Kenai Kings. It probably weighs 60, 70 pounds. And it, it takes off. And I could have broke it off and kept fishing, but I wanted to see it. I knew it was huge. So it runs down. And at some point in this fight, it spools me. But it can't break the line. It'll run against the line, and the line just keeps stretching. At one point, I look way down the river, and I see this guy, and he's come. He's got like he's pulling on this line. I'm like, hey, that's my line, man. <laughs> so he's like, oh, and he drops it, and I keep chasing the fish. And I caught up with him. I mean, but I had a gaff or something. I could have landed him. I'm sure that's totally illegal. But uh, I got up and I saw him. I got his picture. And he was huge. He was all rotten and dying, but he was huge. And uh, but he couldn't break that line. There was just too much stretch in it. So anyhow, the stretch can help you. The stretch can hurt you. Um, other things to know about mono. Monofilament line floats. It'll stay on the surface. Now, if I'm throwing topwater plugs, I use braid. But if you're not using braid, you can rely on mono because it'll stay on top. Um, so that's another good thing about it. Now, a lot of guys get confused when we throw um, fluorocarbon line in the mix. It looks like mono, but it's not mono. It is a game changer, and here's why. It's not invisible to fish. A lot of people think it's invisible to fish, and I've probably written that it's invisible to fish, but it's not. But it's very hard for them to see. The molecular, try to say that in the morning, makeup of the line is such that it reflects light at pretty much the same rate as water, and that makes it virtually invisible to fish. Sometimes it doesn't matter. Sometimes the invisibility of line doesn't matter a bit, but what we're finding is, is that most of the time it matters a lot. Now, I rarely, if ever, spool up completely with fluorocarbon line. One, it's expensive. Two, it, uh, it sinks. So for a lot of applications like drifting for stream trout, things like that, I don't want my line to sink. I want the end to sink, but I don't want the whole length of it to sink. I want to be able to see it. I want to be able to watch the line, helps me detect strikes and lets me know what's going on down there. So that's a, that's a downside of fluorocarbon. It has less stretch than mono. It's, it's not as, uh, not as non-stretch as braid by any means, but it has less stretch than mono. I use it primarily for leader material. And you know, when it first came out, there were just a few people making fluorocarbon. And uh, now there's a lot of people making it. So here's just some notes on, on, on my experience with fluorocarbon. Um, people consider cigar line the gold standard of fluorocarbon, and I wholeheartedly agree. It's more expensive than other brands. Um, but if I was, it's very tough. It's very limp, it works great. If I'm, let's say I'm on the XL and I'm trying to catch a 100 pound tuna on a 40 pound leader and they're finicky, I'm using Seaguar. If I'm just going out to fish power bait for trout at my local reservoir, I'm not gonna spend the money for that. I'm gonna use Berkeley Vanish. 
it's a little stiffer it's a lot cheaper but the invisibility is still there and overall on a big fish I think it's less reliable I mean there there I said it I think it's less reliable than Seaguar but I'm not gonna hook a hundred pound tuna at Folsom Lake so there you go but I use it for leader material I use it for the leader between a dodger and a bait I use it for a leader between a swivel and a and a floating bait like a worm or whatever so some surprising things about fluorocarbon we fish I fish San Francisco Bay a lot this is not a clear water fishery it's far from it but we find if we rig our live bait on fluorocarbon leaders we catch more halibut we catch more stripers even though the water is murky and muddy and off color so I run fluorocarbon leaders almost exclusively now I forgot to mention one brand of line hold that thought the folks at Yozuri make fluorocarbon leader material stuff is I think it's called hybrid or something like that you can look it up but it's the it's the Yozuri fluorocarbon leader material and the stuff's pink absolutely excellent it's stiff but for like trolling for salmon things like that it is tough it is strong they can't see it so if I'm if I'm rigging up if I'm out in the ocean I'm rigging up a dodger with a plug cut herring or something behind it I rig up with 60 pound test of that Yozuri pink stuff not a worry in the world that stuff is strong it's tough I'm not gonna lose a fish because of the line so those are some thoughts about fluorocarbon I got a quick story kind of to illustrate the effectiveness and how important uh, using fluorocarbon can be so I'm at Eagle Lake with my good friend Jim English this is years ago and I just bought a spool of this newfangled fluorocarbon line so four pound test so we go out and we troll zero nothing well we better go fish bait so we go into this cove there's all these bait guys around they're all anchored fishing worms for rainbows you catching anything oh no it's horrible we're not catching anything oh man all right well we're rigging up I tell Jim Jim I'm gonna try this try this stuff out I'm gonna try this vanish fluorocarbon out so I rig up just like him slip bobber but I use an 18 inch liter of this fluorocarbon we both cast out instant hookup for me cast out again instant hookup again I got my two fish limit I got two fish about three pounds sweet so I say here Jim don't even put on a leader just take my rod still no one around us there's a dozen boats there they're not getting a bite Jim pitches out boom boom he's got a limit about that time here come our friends Olin and Darlene Bycroft so we're going in we're going in to pick up our wives and I say to Darlene I says here if you're gonna bait fish just use my rod I hand her the rod and they anchor up and they cast out now before Jim and I can get our anchor up and leave Darlene's fighting a fish still no one else is catching anything same bait same presentation fluorocarbon fluorocarbon made the difference 100 percent and I've been sold on it ever since I mean I can't argue with those kind of results it was incredible one of those one of those really big moments of my fishing career it's, it's like the day when I first tried power bait and I caught 27 trout when I couldn't catch them on anything else and that when, when that happens and you're an experienced angler and you see something work like that you're sold results sell so anyway now I said fluorocarbon sinks so if you're gonna rig up with fluorocarbon it's hard to drift for stream trout if you're gonna spool your whole reel with it you can't work a topwater plug on it your line keeps sinking so I would advise if you're on the mono side of the fence spool up with a good quality monofilament line and uh, use a fluorocarbon leader use a fluorocarbon top shot lots of times these days even when we're using spinning rods we'll spool up with braid and use a fluoro top shot but that's a whole that's a subject for the braid video but anyway I think uh, fluorocarbon 
has really proven to be a game changer. It's the ultimate stealthy approach. It also allows me to use heavier line than I would use. So back in the day, I would use four pound test trout leaders. Use that anymore. I use 10 pound test because I can't see it. So why would I want to use a lighter, more breakable line when I can get away with heavier line? See, I'm always fishing for, it's just an aside, I'm always fishing for big fish. I might be catching 10 inch rainbows, but I'm prepared for when a 10 pound brown comes and bites. And those opportunities come along rarely. And that's why you want the stoutest tackle you can use, the best knots you can tie, and the best line you can, you can afford to buy. And you gotta fish with confidence. Anyway, that's my little talk about monofilament and fluorocarbon line. Just a little bit of explanation from my perspective. Um, I think if you're not using fluorocarbon leaders these days, you're, you're missing out on a lot of hookups. Anyway, I'll catch you on my next podcast. I'm almost to my turnaround here. So you folks have a great day and I'll catch you next time. This is Kel Kellogg signing off.